Hi and welcome to this Netasea uh, presentation, Inside the Mind of a Cybercriminal, How to Beat the Bots. This was delivered at the e-crime event in March this year um, by myself, Ian Pickfield, and our Head of Threat Research, James Maud. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. So today we're going to talk about the mind of a cybercriminal and the world of bots and automated attacks. Now those of you keeping an eye on the news lately will have seen that there's been a number of stories going around where large businesses of a diverse range of verticals have been involved in data breaches. So this is you know, a huge problem to organizations when they see themselves appearing in the news involved in a data breach. But actually when we start to drill into a lot of these, the common problem is credential stuffing, account takeover attacks where users have used weak usernames and password combinations that have been compromised on another site, they've reused the password, and your organization becomes a victim of this. Only a few years ago, when you saw a large scale data breach in the news, people often just breathed a sigh of relief that it wasn't their organization that had been compromised. But what we're seeing more and more is these large scale data breaches are every organization's problem. Password reuse is rife among users, and we're now seeing these statistics like 81% of hacking related breaches are leveraging some form of compromised credentials. And if we look at the companies we've listed here, Deliveroo, Dunkin' Donuts, HSBC, Nest, all these different diverse ranges of businesses are all suffering from the same problem. A lot of the time people assume this is just the large financials, people trying to get into bank accounts. But in reality, the attackers are going after all kinds of different pieces of valuable information. It can be direct financial transactions in banks, in credit cards, that kind of information. It can be loyalty point schemes in the case of Dunkin' Donuts. You know, you shop there every day, you build up a amount of loyalty points, you travel with an airline, they have a reward scheme. This is valuable to an attacker who can compromise and use those credentials to buy flights, buy gift cards, goods and services. In the case of OkCupid, okay you might wonder why the dating site? Well, actually, if an attacker can start with a username and password, and use that to gain a whole wealth of information on you from your sexual preferences to your home address to your social security number, they can really start to do some damage to your online presence. They can start resetting email account passwords, banking passwords. They can use this kind of information to conduct social engineering. So it's a very wide scale problem. And the formula is fairly simple for this. <clears throat> we take compromised credentials found on the dark web, on you know, increasingly not on the dark web, but found somewhere from a large scale data breach we find a site with a login page and we test to see if we can use those to get into that and access information. Data is the new oil, you know, there's huge value in any kind of data they can extract. And it's not just the uh, account takeovers, the you know, credential stuffing that we're seeing here. A couple of symbols at the bottom there, one for cards. Again, we see a lot of organizations being abused just because they have card processing facilities. So people are creating fake accounts or using stolen accounts, logging in, and using the card handling facilities on your e-commerce website to test whether stolen card details are valid or not. You know, this becomes your problem. Initially, a lot of organizations see this and think they're subject to a DDoS attack. And actually it's a credential stuffing, it's a card skimming exercise, just validating credential data, validating card data. The other thing there with the two arms wrestling is to represent competition. What we see with a lot of organizations now is People are interested in what their competitors are up to, what the pricing is. If you're a gambling website, you know, what the latest odds are. If you're a flight website, what the prices, latest flight prices are. So a lot of the time, these websites have been hit with scrapers left, right and center, automatically gathering pricing information to see what's going on in your website. In the case of a lot of e-commerce -re e online retailers we work with, over 90% of the traffic hitting their site is automated. Some of this is good. This is Googlebot, this is price comparison sites. But a lot of this is malicious, unknown competitors, cyber criminals, just trying to gain information on what's going on there, what information they can extract from you. So it becomes very dangerous. And the classic problem is that users are reusing passwords. LastPass did some research and they found that 91% of users were aware of the problem of using reusing passwords, but 61% of them continued to reuse them. And these are the kind of things we see popping up here. So this is a parade shop website. This is not on the dark web, this is on the public internet. And they're publicly buying and selling stolen accounts for things. So it becomes everyone's problem. We talked about Dunkin' Donuts earlier. We can see in here that Dunkin' Donuts, you know, their accounts are for sale. People looking for a cheap way to buy donuts. You pay $2, you get an account with $10 of credit on it. You know, very low risk, very high reward for the attackers here. 
a story we see time and time again. You know, streaming services, Spotify, Netflix, all these online services that we have access to, people are wanting to get access to those and resell them. If you have a Spotify family account, check in. See if you have had some of those accounts, that parts of that account you're not using, resold. It happens all the time. And what we're seeing actually is we've seen the uh, collection one and all these big, big data dumps. You know, we're talking two plus billion records, 900 million unique user accounts and passwords in there. This huge scale of data we're seeing falling out and being put on torrent sites and the public internet. And this really is just the tip of the iceberg. These are the credentials that most of the major cybercrime forums, the people on the dark web have used up extensively on all the major retailers and now have very little value. So they're appearing for free online. But even with these, you know, supposedly low value old breach is this old data, we're still seeing in recent attacks a success rate of between 0.1 and 1% for those credentials. So they still work. That's the problem that they have such a long, uh, long tail of use throughout different websites. And beneath the surface, what we're actually finding is, you know, there's all the dark web forums, there's the sophisticated phishing attacks where they're gathering high value credentials that, you know, for certain targeted individuals, certain organizations, and they're getting much higher success rates than 1% with those. So really we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg surfacing here, and this is a problem that's here to stay. One of the things that people quite often say is, well, there's a barrier to entry here. There's, you know, you've got to know the right people on cybercrime forums to get the quality credentials. You've got to, you know, have all these criminal paths, and actually it's not as big a problem as people make out. In reality, we've seen there already that up to 1% of the freely available credentials on public internet torrent sites are effective, but how hard is it to get, you know, fresh credentials? How hard is it to find these things on the plain internet? So if we start off with a simple Google search, we can look for something called check my dump on Twitter. Now be very careful searching for check my dump. You can come up with all sorts of different searches, but this Twitter feed is the one we're looking for here. And here they're regularly posting proof that they have quality credentials. They're not giving you the full dump, but they're giving you lists of dozens of hundreds, in some cases of thousands of different credentials, sometimes just generic usernames and passwords. Sometimes these are for specific sites, streaming services. And I'll say this offers you a 4K, you know, HD package that's been subscribed to. You can log in with this username and password, get access to these films, get access to this Netflix account. So it's really dangerous thing and we're seeing there just on pastebin you can see those huge lists. Even if we just do a simple search for combos, which is kind of the slang for these uh, combinations of username and passwords, we see tutorials on how to get them. We see a huge amount of information on the public internet there of how to get started as a cyber criminal. And when we're talking about inside the mind of a cyber criminal, this could be the teenager sat in your bedroom at home who's decided they want to get in on someone else's Fortnite account. They want to gain some online points from some game. And this is how these things can spiral very quickly. Cost of anonymity as well. So people often say, well, this is you know, a problem we can solve through simple rules. We'll see a lot of traffic coming from one IP address. One user will be able to block them, will be able to report them, someone can investigate. The problem is that doesn't, doesn't work. We see on these online forums, Sentry MBA, which is one of the tools used for credential stuffing, their forum there, people advertising hundreds and thousands of different proxies that they can route your traffic through automatically to appear from anywhere in the world. Proxy list there saying fast and fresh proxy lists every two hours it refreshes. The tools that people can use to conduct these kind of attacks automatically can consume these things. They can use Tor, they can use exit nodes around the globe. So as soon as you block an IP, you block a data center, they reappear somewhere else. It's like this never ending game of whack-a-mole. And if we look at some of the tools out there, you know, we see this one in particular, Sniper here, quite a popular account recovery made simple and they're advertising themselves there as credential stuffing. To get this, to get a legitimate license key, it costs you $20 in Amazon gift cards. So it's not exactly an expensive piece of software. There are cracked versions for completely for free online. So we can get the credentials for free, we can get anonymous proxies for free, and we can get a tool that makes it very easy to do credential stuffing. If you're looking at the, you know, the descriptions there, modern UI, good chat support, online help, tutorials, all these things, this is better support, better usability than a lot of the security tools professionals are using to defend themselves against these kind of attacks. And again, this isn't the dark web. This is available online. If we start to drill into the sniper tool here, it comes with specific configs already defined for a number of popular services from, you know, online pizza retailers in the UK to streaming services to Amazon accounts, all these different ways. And there's a huge, you know, 
forum behind all this where you can get new configurations to target different websites. And the way these work is you load in a list of usernames and passwords, you load in a list of proxies, and you choose a site you want to target. And what these configurations allow you to do is not only try and get the credentials in there, but extract information. So I'll show you in a second the kind of information you get back out when a credential is valid. But the really interesting thing in these is we're seeing this shift as they're realizing that more and more websites are becoming a bit aware of the bot problem and dealing with it on the front end of the website. We're seeing these configurations shifting to target APIs and third party integrations to slip under the radar and avoid some of the traditional ways like JavaScript to use to fingerprint users and just get those credentials uh, validated. So here's an example where you know they've run some um, accounts against a particular service to see what's happening. And they've quickly come up with a couple of hits here. Now you see in the capture section, it's actually an online uh, streaming service for sports and they've detailed there what packages are available with that account. So not only have they validated the credentials, they validated some of the information out of it. Now that could be the number of points you have in your account, the value of those, all these different kind of things, but it makes, makes it very easy. And you can see in the high level statistics there, they were quickly checking 168 credentials a minute, going through lots of proxies, lots of, uh, you know, invalid responses and retries are very easy because if it doesn't work through one proxy, if that's blocked, the, the software just reroutes through something else. So this is trivial exercise for people to start doing these low level cybercrime campaigns and really start to do these credential stuffing attacks. And this is why we're seeing more and more prevalence of these in the market. So how are these bots evolving? What we're seeing there is the kind of the low level, the entry level, and that seems even for many organizations dauntingly sophisticated, right? You know, these are automated attacks that jump in from multiple IPs. Your traditional defenses are focused on what ports are open, what software is patched, is this legitimate traffic? The problem of credential stuffing is it's exposing flaws in your business logic of, well, how do I tell the difference between legitimate user logging in and a fake account, you know, an automated thing logging in? So it becomes very difficult to spot. And at that, you know, as the market evolves, these tools are doing quite well at it, but the more sophisticated threat actors are able to appear even more like human beings, even more like real users on the internet by using automated browsers. We've got Phantom JS, we've got Selenium, we've got all these ways to automate real browsers so they can pass the tests that you might pose to say, is this user using a real browser? Are they moving the mouse around? You know, these simple fingerprinting techniques that are often used by first generation bot solutions um, become evaded by the more sophisticated tooling. Internet of things, you know, there's this enormous never ending supply now of vulnerable devices being connected to domestic IPs, which can be exploited and then used as a proxy to serve stuff in credentials through. So you're seeing distributed attacks across thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different IPs driven by the internet of things. And we've got APIs, which have proven this bigger attack surface as more and more companies have mobile apps integration points with their systems. The attackers are using these to try and stuff in credentials to try and capture information. And then finally, some of the traditional solutions, the captures, you know, the recapture pages that you get served. Again, this is easy for attackers to bypass. The modern tooling, you know, there's a service here called Two Capture, which allows you to pay from 50 cents for a thousand solved captures. So they have humans on the other end of this, or they have some sort of machine learning automation to solve the captures and replay a response. So even that, gives you, you know, users a bad experience for real users, and it's no barrier for the attackers. And this is kind of what we see in the marketplace, that there are different types of attack. There's huge volumes out there. A lot of this is basic or levels of automated using simple off-the-shelf tooling, getting more sophisticated, more distributed, using dedicated uh, botnets to distribute the attack globally, using private botnets to avoid appearing on any you know blacklist or anything like that so the really advanced ATOs that we're now seeing where they're able to respond and you know deal with things in almost real time so every time you put a mitigation in place they will change their user agent they will change their tactic they will change their fingerprint to remain undetected and that's what a lot of the first generation bot solutions are really struggling to keep up with so you turn on a tick box solution you know something that's integrated into existing WAF you'll see the volumes drop off but actually you're still being bypassed by those more sophisticated attacks. So I'm gonna turn over at this point to my colleague Ian Pitfield, who's gonna to talk to you a little, a little bit more about this kind of approach that businesses can take and how they can gain visibility of this threat. Yeah, thanks James. So what I wanted to pick up with this is, this is typically an organizational view of what good looks like when looking at bot mitigation. So our organization will want to have full visibility traffic across websites, mobile apps and APIs. Mobile apps and APIs are often overlooked. 
use a list of websites that are our main target. But quite often we're seeing a trend of attackers will go away, the real tool, and they'll look to attack a more vulnerable part of the business that could be an API. Um, could also look like, obviously, the, the being able to identify between human and non-human activity goes without saying, but also to be able to make informed decisions on that on that intelligence that has context. So we've we've identified a bot, what context does it have? Where's it coming from? How does that impact my business? What activity are they trying to do? Um, also, certainly retail and e-com, the, the genuine users are not affected by this journey, by, by on their journey. So they're not seeing unnecessary captures being thrown at them. Um, they're not being blocked, you know, based on some criteria that we've put in. So again, accuracy is key. The website login page is secure. Again, for, it goes without saying, but what good looks like to most organizations that have a website with login is that we're protecting that login. The user accounts are not going to be compromised. We're doing everything we can as a business to make sure we safeguard that account. And giving customers peace of mind. We can't tra change trends in users. You know, users will reuse passwords, as James mentioned earlier on, but we can do our utmost to make sure we identify when credentials are being used against our website in, in an automated way. Um, and also the, the, the reputation of the business is protected. You know, we're not gonna be making front, front page headlines because we won't be able to you know, pick an attack against one of our parts of the business that's exposed to the web. Um, now there are some barriers to this. So if we just go on to the next slide, typical barriers that we hear from customers about why they couldn't put this into practice. Let's start with lack of visibility. So first one is low confidence in the data. There are solutions out there that may provide a level of mitigation, but often they hide the, the decision-making process. So if you get it wrong, if you block a legitimate user from getting to the site, or perhaps even worse, you let you know a bot through you know, without picking it up, sometimes that decision-making is not exposed. Um, and again, that can have pretty catastrophic effects. And again, that feeds into limited understanding of traffic analysis and detection rates. What does the intelligence, the, the data, the insight that you're providing me mean? Give me some context. Um, and without that context, again, it's just another data source. Um, so some of the other challenges that we that we see, uh, it's difficult to do. You know, architecture is complex. It's difficult to integrate. It's difficult to integrate existing solutions with automation. It becomes a siloed product that, again, just has its own dedicated dashboards. Um, and there seems to be a reliance also on bundled solutions. So you know, let's say you, you're with a WAF provider, you know, you, you clearly look at the, 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 the bot tool that's provided by that provider first, you know, that would be the easy path, but often those solutions, um, again, are not up to the challenge of the more sophisticated bot activity. They are again, rules-based solutions that don't look at the user behavior, uh, which we'll come on to later. Um, some solutions as well, there's a lot of solutions actually out there that are based on JavaScript in isolation. So they um, you know, obviously have coding changes. You're putting third party JavaScript on your website that doesn't cover naturally things like mobiles and APIs. You gotta be, you know, look at developing SDKs and perhaps putting a piece of infrastructure in front of an API. It gets really complex really quickly. Um, the other area is the appetite for risk. So is there, a, is there a concern over latency? Yeah, absolutely. Are we going to add some time on our user journey? Of course we are, if we if we take a, a legacy approach. Um, and that's gonna impact a genuine user. It's gonna make their journey unnecessarily long. That may, certainly in retail, again, as an example, that may be, you know, milliseconds, but if their journey is frustrated or interrupted in any way unnecessarily, then typically that, that person may go elsewhere. Um, there is a, a reluctance to block traffic as well. So again, if we're not exposing that decision-making process, if we are, um, if we are, uh, we don't have faith in the data, and we're not sure why a decision has been made, then typically you know, solutions might be turned down just to, just to uh, um, not block any traffic. Um, and, and the last one's probably the most important one, which sort of has some follow on slides, which is concern over security approach. So a lot of solutions out there rely 
on a coding based approach. So um, they would use JavaScript to identify and make decisions around fingerprinting, source, looking at the user agents, you know, identify some browser based features and, and basic interactions with that user's machine um, as an example. I think when we were at eCrime, when we gave this talk, all of us or majority of us agreed in that session that JavaScript isn't a security solution. It was never designed to solve security challenges. So actually putting all your faith in this to ultimately solve a security challenge raises questions um, in the first instance. Um, and again, it's difficult to architect, you know, how do you put this into an app? You've got bespoke development work there. How do you protect an API where you can't naturally place a piece of code? Um, and ultimately the mitigation is in the um, arena of the attacker. So, you know, effectively a lot of, um, a lot of solutions obfuscate their JavaScript, which we'll come to, but obfuscation um, is not the way to solve a security challenge. Um, because obfuscation leads to, you know, attackers again working around just another hurdle. So if they're if they're determined enough, they'll go away and find a free tool online that will put that JavaScript and code in plain text. And then you've got ultimately a playlist for the attacker to work around on your site. So if this JavaScript's locking based on rate limiting or mouse trails, you'll be able to figure out what those limits are, um, and you know, set your bar lower to work around them. So. This is not the ideal way to solve this challenge, but a lot of legacy OS, James referred to them as first generation tools, do actually do it this way. Um, so we, we take a very different approach. Now we could have gone down that approach, but those approaches are, are fundamentally very easy to build. You know, anyone almost can build a JavaScript piece of JavaScript and put it on a website. So they're very easy to build, they're very quick to get to market. Um, and they will have an impact on your traffic, but that impact will lessen over time as the attackers work out what mitigations you've got in place. You know, you'll see a, a drop in mitigation and you'll, you'll see a rise in, in success, successful um, attacks getting through. So we take a very different approach. We are a machine learning first company. We built the business around a team of data scientists that have brought this product to life. Um, and the real differentiation, differentiation um, is that we focus on the user behavior, the user interaction with your website. So you know, there's thousands of signals that we look for, how quickly are they traversing pages, how quickly are they entering text, how quickly are they moving mouse trails. As I said, there's thousands of different signals that we correlate together to make a decision on whether something's a bot or it's human. And then obviously we deep dive in, into the decision-making process a bit more and we'll, we'll expose that and give you context around that. But the fundamental difference is we're not just relying on something that's public, that's inspectable and ultimately spoofable. This is a hosted cloud platform. It's predominantly hosted in AWS that you plug into and you have an output out the other side. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into what the output may look like because it may be mitigation, it might just be intelligence. But the, 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 the secret behind our solution is using a data-driven, data science-driven approach to you know, make a decision and, and, and assess and risk score traffic based on you know our algorithms and ultimately what good behavior looks like for you. So we take into account and we tailor this and tune this to your organization. That's a very straightforward process where we actually tune and, and hone up the algorithms once it's in place with you. So we can identify good looks like for you as a business. Then obviously anything outside of that, you know, is, is, is potentially red flagged. Um, so we built our approach around four core pillars, and that was a speed, transparency, accuracy, and usability. We'll go into one of the each one of these quickly. Speed: the solution has to be quick to deploy. It's got to be quick to detect, quick to mitigate, um, and it has to make sure that your user journey is is unaffected. So the way that we do that is we have bespoke integrations with um, AWS, Cloudflare, Fastly. We can do this to APIs. We can do this through an F5 web log, um, you know, consumption, if you will. There's lots of different ways to plug in our solution to get you under underway um, as quickly as possible. Transparency, we deliver the decision-making process. We give you visibility over your traffic. We give you the ability to do your own analysis. We give you deep dive analysis of the traffic. We give you decision-making context. Um, you know, this isn't just a, 
we've identified lots of bots on your website. We actually give you details and we categorize them for you um, and give you insight into that. Uh, so transparency through intelligence is our second core pillar. Uh, we are really unmatched in our accuracy just by the very nature of the approach that we take. By focusing on user interactions with your website and by analysing thousands, not hundreds of signals, you can actually be incredibly more accurate in your de decision making process and ultimately your categorization of web traffic. Is it human? Is it not human? Um, and that's going to give you confidence in the solution. Um, we have the ability to use JavaScript as a signal. You know, typically with machine learning with data sites, the more you feed into it, the more accurate it is. But we are a machine learning first, so we'd always start with that approach. If you have the appetite to you know, feed in things like device fingerprinting, we of course we can do that and we provide that, but it's optional. And that's the key behind our approach. We don't solely require uh, you know, that to, in order to, to deliver our, our technology. Um, and we do things like feeding reputation, non-bads, non-blacklists into that approach as well. So this is a multi-dimensional approach. There's a correlation of data that occurs to give us this risk categorization as for, as, as for us to be able to make you know, informed decisions um, on your traffic. So usability, it's really easy to get started with us. You can try the solution to PLC without any financial commitment. Um, you could use us as an intelligence feed to you know, ultimately help you identify your bot challenges. We give you portals and intelligence and visibility. As we talked about, we've got out of the box integration. So if you're using Fastly, Cloudflare, CloudFront, we have a reverse proxy solution and also an API based solution that may take a feed from, you know, let's say your web logs, an IS web log, an application log, an F5 web log, an Nginx web log of some description. And we can consume that through our platform, through our models and give you an output. And that output might not always be mitigation. You may just want to use us as an intelligence source, as a sensor to give you better decision making functionality internally. So, for example, if we identify that there is a credential stuff from attack against your organization, you'll be able to identify what accounts need changing. And you might do that through some kind of identity or access management provider internally. So this isn't just pure play mitigation. This is about visibility and intelligence as well and context around that. Um, and this is a partnership led approach. You know, we're not just a platform or a solution that you subscribe to. We are going to help you on this journey we're going to help help you get the most out of the platform and help you understand your traffic in more detail using our um, our approach come and see us at netasia.com um, we'd love to talk to you in more depth if you want a demo if you'd like a next meeting or a follow-up meeting if you'd like to talk to myself or james again follow up through the website um, yeah. or through the actions after this webinar thank you for listening and we'll speak to you soon